Welcome everybody to our live LinkedIn event, Digital Innovation and its Impact on Family Planning. My name is Ariana DeHogue and I work in the Biopharma Sustainability Team. And every year we have a LinkedIn event around World Population Day highlighting key issues around family planning. So why family planning? Because of Bayer, we have committed ourselves to help provide 100 million women in low middle income countries with modern contra contraception yearly by 2030. This is in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, specifically SDG 3, so gender equality, and 5, which is health and well being, of course. So, additionally, last year in autumn, we did a visual story with DevEx on the role of digital in family planning, and the uptake far exceeded our expectations. And this is when we realized the interest in the role of innovation and digital when it comes to supporting girls and women and couples with family planning. And this interest spans the globe. And for this reason, we have decided to invite some key experts here today on this topic to enlighten all of us further. But before we delve into it, why does this topic matter? Well, family planning is, of course, a human right, and it's also central to women's empowerment, reducing poverty, protecting maternal and child health, driving economic development, and achieving sustainable development. At the moment, over 218 million women of reproductive age in low middle income countries who want to avoid pregnancy are not using a modern contraceptive method. Nearly one third of all women in low middle income countries begin childbearing in adolescence. And according to the World Bank, over 99% of maternal deaths occur in low and lower middle income countries. Reasons for inadequate family planning range from a lack of access to information and services to lack of support from partners or from communities. And these factors threaten women's ability to build a better future for themselves, their families and their communities. And of course, it also affects a growing world population. The use of digital technologies to support healthy sexual and reproductive behaviors is one of several promising high impact practices in family planning. So mobile internet, yeah, phones, tablets and other devices is more accessible than ever before. And it has become apparent that digital technology can improve health outcomes, especially young people are more digitally savvy than ever before, as we know, and digital technologies enable us to put information at young people's fingertips, empowering them to make healthy and informed decisions. So advancements in digital technology have opened up entirely new ways of reaching people. We know Notice this in COVID as well. So together, we need to continue to adapt and employ these emerging technologies and tools to improve access to family planning and reproductive health information and services for people across the globe. As family planning goes hand in hand with gender equality, of course, the success of one affects the success of the other. Our partners are also utilizing digital technologies more than ever to increase global access to family planning and to reproductive health information and services. And these technologies allow us to reach women and girls and people across gender identities with accurate information, helping them make informed decisions about their sexual and reproductive health, relationships, and of course their families. We certainly realize the importance of these innovations and technologies, but the question is how do we become a leader in this field? Well, certainly not alone. We were very proud to announce in 2022 that Bayer was the first private company to join the UNFPA Equalizer Fund, which will provide seed money, expertise and support to pilot stage projects mostly created by women with the goal of fighting gender based violence and improving family planning in low middle income countries. Now, you may also know the buyer has co-funded Your Life and World Contraception Day with a broad alliance of NGOs. And World Contraception Day is coming up again on September 26th, so keep a lookout for that. And here, together with our partners, we inform young people worldwide about their family planning options. And this is another fantastic example of how a strong international presence of online media and social influencers make a huge difference in reaching millions of young people worldwide with family planning information and options. 
and our partnerships are growing. So, for example, last year we also signed a partnership with the Deutsche Stiftung Weltbevölkerung, also known as DSW. This is an international private nonprofit foundation addressing sexual and reproductive health and population dynamics on the co-creation of a program in Kenya called Life Yangu. And this program not only informs young people about family planning options, but also provides them with data on where to find help from their local healthcare facilities. So I'm really pleased that we have Evelyn with us here today to explain more about this to us later. And the introductions are coming in a minute. So in line with this, I am really excited to announce that in the last week we signed not one, but two new partnerships in the realm of digital and family planning. Firstly, with UNFPA India, we signed a two-year partnership agreement which will focus on a comprehensive program aimed at providing sexual and reproductive health rights services to adolescents, youth and couples in India. So this flagship program is called My Right, My Choices, and it will cover four districts in two states. Digital campaigning will be an important cornerstone of this, in addition to close collaboration with local authorities. And we will learn a lot more about this in a minute from Jay Deep. Overall, impact measurement will be a focus. And so this is to see how and how many individuals, women, families can be reached and supported. And the program will be built on a blended approach of adopting digital platforms, namely an AI enabled chatbot, as well as health system strengthening models. With intense campaigns for contraceptive uptake, the project reach of this AI enabled platform is estimated to be about 6 million individuals by 2027. Once finalized, the program should be ready for scale up with a long term vision to become donor independent and eventually to be integrated into the local healthcare system. The collaboration between Bayer and UNFP India, by the way, is part of a memorandum of understanding which Bayer signed with UNFPA headquarters, which is why we have Maria Rosa with us here today. She's been a long term partner of ours, and we're always so happy when she can join us and share her amazing international insights. More in a minute. The second partnership I'm so pleased to announce is with Zuri Health in Sub-Saharan Africa. Zuri Health is a virtual health platform already existent, which provides affordable and accessible healthcare services across Sub-Saharan Africa via mobile app, website, WhatsApp, bot, and SMS service. And what they have done is also built a virtual hospital comprised of an app, website, and a chatbot. And the mobile app gives users access to pharmacies, labs, and diagnostic options, and their telemedicine services include medical consultations with healthcare practitioners. So contraception and family planning will now become a key focus for Zuri Health through our partnership. And in the next six months and beyond, we hope to take key steps forward with Zuri in reaching thousands more women, first in Kenya and later in other sub-Saharan countries. So you can see it's really exciting times when it comes to digital in family planning. So without further ado, I now want to introduce our esteemed experts that I've already mentioned to you briefly. Maria Rosa Cotillo has been a dedicated partner of ours and a speaker at all of our yearly LinkedIn events. Thank you for joining us again. We are so lucky to have her here and she's the chief of the strategic partnerships branch within the United Nations Population Fund. She has more than 20 years of professional experience also working in the private sector on issues related to corporate sustainability and she's served also as a legal expert for various institutions. So thank you for being here. We also are very honored to have Evelyn Zamba join us. So she's from the DSW, as I mentioned earlier. And Evelyn is a development expert who has also over 20 years of experience in working with civil society and government and throughout her work in program design, community development and human rights based approaches. She has set a strong focus on gender, sexual and reproductive health rights and women's rights. So we're very lucky to have your expertise here with us today, Evelyn. And now turning to our two new partnerships, representing our UNFPA India partnerships, it's so exciting that J.D. Biswas could join us. He is the Chief of Policy, Advocacy and Partnerships at UNFPA. Previously, he was Senior Governance Advisor in the UK government, and he has two decades of experience in public policy analysis, advisory work in many countries. So welcome, J.D. We look forward to your insights. 
And last but certainly not least, we have Titi Lola Ola Olu Hassan with us, representing also our new partnership with Zuri Health. Titi is an innovative commercial leader with over 18 years experience in sales, strategy, product management, port operations, and crises communications. And I'm pleased to announce she was recently selected as one of the top 30 women founders of Vivatech for the Female Founders Challenge and was recognized by the Lagos State Health Commission Nigeria for her support for maternal and neonatal health. So how wonderful you could join us, Titi. So I'd like to begin by giving each of you about two minutes to answer one key question for our audience, namely, what should the audience know about the pressing issues for girls and women in low middle income countries that they are currently facing when it comes to family planning? So Titi, I'll, I'll start with you. Thank you, Ariane, and thank you for having me. I'll start by saying that in low and middle, middle income countries, especially in Africa, despite all the progress that has been made, women still have a limited access to healthcare, the full range of healthcare services they need. And why is this? It's because despite even areas where there are facilities available, most women in Africa have to choose between survival and healthcare. So when you have a situation where somebody has to think that going to the hospital and spending transfer money to go to hospital might take food off the table, women will tend to choose to survive and to help their family survive. But the flip side of it is also that we're seeing that across Africa, the mobile phone penetration is really getting very high. In Kenya, for example, you have a mobile penetration of over 100%, which means some people have more than one mobile phone. So this presents a very interesting possibility for women who at least 70% of them are already having mobile phones and there's a way to access them with the information they need on these platforms. How about Maria Rosa? Thank you very much, Ariane. And, and just to say, I'm so happy to be here again and, and every year show the progress of this partnership. And, and I think, you know, Ariane, um, Titi started suggesting this. It's a multifaceted problem. Hmm? There are many components and many practical implications of lack of access to contraception. Um, our State of the World Population Report in 2022 said that in the world there are at least 121 million unintended pregnancies. And this is very much connected to the lack of access, to the lack of education, to the lack of awareness building. I'm just going to quote another, um, another datum, which I think is, is interesting and, and again goes back to what Didi was saying. So there is an indicator no, which is called the contraceptive prevalence rate, the CPR. Mm -hmm. So there's the gap between low and middle income countries and higher income countries is like 40 percent so can we live with a 40 percent gap in access to contraception to really think about solving this major issue also unfpa is the leading un agency on sexual reproductive rights this is something that we deal with every day and as you said at the beginning Ariane, this is part of a broader conversation around the sustainable development goals can we really think about achieving the sustainable development goals if we don't guarantee access to sexual reproductive rights that's the question and of course the answer is no so for me really addressing the multifaceted nature of this problem is the key and that requires ecosystems of partners Thank you. What about Jay Deep? What are your insights here? Thank you. Good evening from India, New Delhi. I'm very pleased and delighted with this partnership. So thank you very much, Bear. Uh, three uh, sort of points drawing from the colleagues who spoke earlier. I think the fundamentals, uh, if I may put for a country like India, is very important before we jump into the family planning situation. So for the story of women and girls, it's a story of a long road. And I think the distance traveled is something we must also recognize. And we know there are hundreds of miles to go for. Now on that, what we see, India is a young country and uh, one in 10 uh, Indians is a young girl of age 10 years. A more number of young girls are in school. They are learning more and delaying their marriage. So that's on the brighter side. 
There are better health outcomes for younger women. Uh, compared to a few decades earlier, women are living longer. Dress. The risk of dying from giving birth has been cut significantly from a maternal mortality rate of 254 two decades back. Now it is under 100, 97, and on the path to attaining the goal of 70. However, uh, this is the distance traveled, but there is a long way to go. And I think there are three challenges that we from India see. The first one is how the society values the women and girls, and how women and girls themselves have the degree of bodily autonomy and the reproductive choice. I think that's something we should delve into when we speak later, because that has got implications on access to family planning and other health services. The second one is a, is a bright spot, but there are gray areas, is the digital divide. Uh, yes, uh, Titi, as you said, it's uh, fascinating that there are more uh, mobile phones than people. In India, what we witness is it's going at an accelerated rate for younger people to have mobile phones. But it is incredible, the digital divide. The younger men have almost twice the number of uh, mobile phone as a proportion than younger women. And again, when you uh, take the access to internet, uh, that further drops. Uh, in fact, in two of the states where we are partnering with Bear, uh, we'll talk about it, how the digital divide is so prominent. And therefore, this addressing of the blended approach is so full of potential and is going to be challenging. And finally, I think the key question also is about how the girls and women themselves see the value in empowerment. Because one of the social norms research we have commissioned recently gives us a very interesting finding that more than uh, caregivers, more than media, more than the community, No, I think Jay Deep. Jay, you've muted yourself. Sorry, I was just mentioning about the early research that's come in that's showing that a lot of change will be driven by individuals, uh, parents, uh, caregivers in the immediate family. And that's something we may pick up on further because there's early research. And I think that's got great potential to uh, focus on the individual uh, as a change agent herself and her immediate family members, which apparently has greater impact. So those are my initial thoughts uh, to start off. Thank you. Thank you. It's so interesting also to see the the different facets of of your discussion here. Um, Evelyn, what would be your key insight here? Thank you. Um, thank you for the introductions and as well for the comments that have been made by the other panelists. Uh, from my view, I think that uh, even though women's rights are increasingly being accepted and recognized as human rights globally, and indeed in our countries in the South. Enjoyment of these rights remain challenged significantly by many factors, including patriarchal practices and tendencies, including um, social norms that continue to devalue women, uh, including public perceptions and attitudes towards the place of women. Uh, while that would be on one side, I think the other side would be that while the laws and policies that we have in place are very progressive, uh, strongly recognizing and placing women's rights and their protections on a very high pedestal, enjoyment of those rights significantly remain unattained and realized for majority of women, including younger women. And these would include rights such as rights to sexual reproductive health and rights, uh, protection from gender-based violence, uh, their empowerment, including enjoyment of um, economic rights, but also access to critical rights such as education. And this would be largely on account of, uh, uh, for instance, lack of, uh, shall we say, implementation of those policies that are very well articulated, but also lack of accountability uh, by the for enjoyment and protection of those rights. Uh, by virtue of the fact that perhaps the demand side is weak, but also the responsibility on the government side or the duty bearer is also on a lower threshold. So we find a situation where, while rights are recognized for women, enjoyment continues to be challenged. And now, as even we are talking about the sexual reproductive health 
and family planning, which is a critical driver for enjoyment of the sexual rights, you realize then other challenges come into the you know into that space you look at um, ability of women and young girls indeed to demand uh, sexual reproductive health it is challenged perhaps by the myths that i've spoken about the social norms but also the patriarchal tendencies women in many communities are not expected to 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 demonstrate to indicate enjoyment of their rights towards sexual health in fact uh, in some communities sexual sex happens to women they don't participate so with that kind of background then you realize even when young girls are growing up it is very difficult for many of them to recognize that in their own right as human beings they are entitled to having fulfilling sexual lives Se fulfilling sexual lives would also include the ability to determine when and how and with whom to have those sexual relations and then transfer that also to including decisions around when they want to have babies and when not to. So the circumstances that young women generally find themselves in in our context is that one of inability to enjoy those rights by failure of the system and lack of implementation of the policies. I thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yes, again, so one could see how family planning is is such an important human right. Ultimately, it affects so many facets. Um, I do want to give a, a quick shout out to our audience um, because at the moment we have people dialed in from over 30 countries, including Germany, Brazil, US, Canada, Mexico, Peru, Kenya, India, Portugal, Spain, Nigeria, Colombia, Algeria, and the UK, uh, to name a few. So uh, thank you to all of you uh, for joining joining us here today in this discussion. Um, I'd like to throw out a question to, to any and all of you. Um, what are some of the greatest changes that you've seen just in the last years in the field of family planning, both good and bad? Jay, would you like to jump in? Sure. Um, I think it's a it's a great question to look at in last few years in india when i particularly look at there is this uh, mcpr which maria rosa mentioned the adoption of modern contraceptive prevalence rate has jumped nine percentage points uh, crossing the halfway mark from 47 percentage to 56 percent which really is due to the concentrated effort of the government to reach out particularly to underserved uh, districts and I think with a full service package there's a particular program uh, which has kind of given lessons on what can work and there is a lot of link to traditionally India had lesser choice in the basket of reproductive uh, choice for women which has increased and um, in the last country program in UNFPA's last five years we noticed in the 14 districts uh, UNFPA supported there were 90 percent of the health facilities which had at least five reproductive choices for women to adopt, contraceptive choices. Now, I think that that makes it different because traditionally India relied far more on sterilization, female sterilization as a permanent approach. So I think what I'm trying to say is that the health systems approach, which is, in fact, Ariane, one of the components of our partnership, is, is a key uh, component for a country like India because it is so vast and so diverse that the large government sector and public sector and the service providers who are at the front line, uh, mainly women, auxiliary health workers and midwives, they have a particular role to reach out to people. And that's something that we really have to uh, further work on and use technology. And the other part of the story is the social norms, which we touched upon, is how do we make a difference in such social norms which are constraining women and again, I would like to cite a little bit of a research again we are looking at. It seems the divergence of uh, how sexual behavior will be allowed or constrained happens right at the start of puberty. And there the men or boys are allowed to express their freedoms and express to go further and you know express them sexually and all of that. Whereas that's just the right place where the women are then shackled or the girls are shackled and constrained and norms and behaviors kick into place. So I think what it is telling us is something very interesting that how can we make a difference right there when a girl is 10, 11, and equally when the boys are 10, 11, and what kind of interventions can be made 
uh, exactly at that crucial juncture. And luckily, we also have the advantage of the digital space coming in. So I think I want to rest on those two points that the on one side, the systems reaching out, but on the demand side from the community side, how do we also tackle the constraining norms? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, you went into mute again, but we got your point. Thank you so much, Jay. And any other key changes that uh, any of you have seen just in the last years? Yeah, I would like to chime in right there and uh, pick up from uh, Jay's point on social norms, but to say that uh, the growth of the anti-rights movement seems then to buttress the kind of negative impact we are seeing for the enjoyment of sexual reproductive health rights by women and especially when you're looking at um, how then that is hindering uh, number one support public support for sexual reproductive health uh, policy support resourcing and as well as alliance building for the sexual reproductive health as a sector so i think the growth of anti-rights which gradually but surely is creeping into this space has to a certain extent intimidated even would be support for for that kind of conversation i mean you want to look at that from even the kind of political pronouncements sometimes you hear from leaders the kind of fear you see in the public when we are talking about rights such as lgbtq rights when you're talking about the right to women for women to make choices about for instance, when to have an abortion or not to have an abortion. Very few people are willing to put up their hands and say, yes, we recognize it is a woman's choice to decide when to carry to term and when not to. And, and this, all of it is growing from this very slow but very forthright and firm growth of intolerance around reproductive health rights for women. And we are also seeing in some of con our contexts the kind of backlash that comes up upon those who come out strongly to 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 to, to speak on on their support for 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 sexual minorities if you like or to speak about the need for young women young girls to have access to information on their sexuality to have access to contraception which is a very huge topic even in our country right now uh, we are taking the legal route we are taking a policy angle to some of these topics. And we also know that statistics are showing us differently. While we don't want to accept that young girls are having sex, that they are sexually active at even increasingly younger ages, we are also unable to accept that the, some of the repercussions of that those choices is what we are seeing in the increase in the number of pregnancies, in the number of unsafe abortions that are happening, in the deaths that are happening and unreported. Uh, because of unsafe abortion. I stop there. No, thank you, Evelyn. Maria Rosa, I saw you nodding halfway through that comment. Yeah, I, I was nodding, but I think Titi was what, wanted to add something and she was before me, so I'm happy to give her the floor first and I'll, and I'll, and I'll wrap up with three sound bites at the end. Titi. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Maria Rosa. I was going to say uh, that one of the things that we have also seen is that in the past couple of years, uh, the discussions about female rights and reproductive health has become more public. Some of the conversations we're seeing today in Africa, we were not having those conversations, say, five, six years ago. With the growth of social media, people are speaking more about these issues. But then what you then see is also a lot of misinformation. And even talking about women who need and who are looking for uh, modern contraceptives, there's a whole lot of misinformation that might actually stop them from accessing because they're not getting access to the right resources as well. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, Maria Rosa, go ahead. Now, if, if I think about, uh, let's say, three things in the past year, in the past 12 months. Well, first of all, November 2022, the world reached 8 billion. And so um, our latest state of the world population report says 8 billion opportunities, 8 billion possibilities. If, if, and one of the conditions is, if um, 
equal rights and particularly the right to choose uh, and the right to bodily autonomy are really recognized. So this is the first thing. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, there's a complex discussion around the eight billions, but really our message is recognizing sexual and reproductive rights is at the basis uh, of recognizing an equal society that helps everyone to thrive, starting with women and girls. So that's the first thing. The second thing is taking into account the increasing recurring humanitarian situations hmm, and the impact of climate change also on sexual reproductive rights. I don't think we can shy away from that anymore. Hmm. So there's a direct impact. Humanitarian contexts are increasing. The lack of access to sexual reproductive rights the prevention of gender-based violence, particularly in those contexts, is alarming every day. So we need to be vigilant and we need to be present there to make sure that in these situations of emergencies, of fragility, we don't leave any woman and girl behind. And then the third message, which I think is very important, again, is the need to finance the global agenda for sexual and reproductive rights. I think I always have that the, the latest figures, we're talking about uh, to, to, in, to ensure access to um, modern family planning in 100, let's say in 120 countries as a priority. We had calculated from 2020 to 2030, so the milestone for the, sex, uh, for the sustainable development goals, $68.5 billion. There's presently still a gap of almost $60 billion. So we need to make a choice. We need to make a political choice, a strategic choice, a choice of investing in women and girls if we really want to make sure that that gap is, is filled. And we are in 2023, so the 2030 is tomorrow. Thank you. Those are very, though, thank you so much. They're really uh, quite shocking figures and, and very poignant that you pointed that out. Um, um, you know, I'll, I'll take with me the eight billion opportunities, um, but yes, a, a very long way for us all to go. Um, just staying in that line, um, what, Maria Rosa, would be some of the crucial steps we need to take to advance gender equality in family planning? So one of it is funding. You've mentioned that. Anything else we should be aware of? So, so I'll, I'll jump probably into the, into the, the idea of partnering together. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I came from the private sector to, to UNFPA seven years ago. Um, I had the privilege of work, I'm privileged to work with many types of partners. So my, the first lesson that I learned and that I learn every day is that it's important to be complementary in efforts and build partnerships that are real ecosystems where we all bring together our added value. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I see this wishy-washy collaborations where, where everyone does everything and they don't go very far. I think that for filling that gap, it's a financing gap, yes, but it tells me a story also of lack of meaningful partnerships where everyone is clear on what we have to do. Mm -hmm. So my first message on this and answering your question, Ariane, what is it that we need to do? We need to build meaningful ecosystems of partners. All of us are putting a lot of passion. All of us are putting a lot of efforts for the agenda of, of women and girls. And we all truly believe in that. So I think we really need to come together and, and put together our different added values, build those ecosystems of partners. As, as, as it was mentioned before, those ecosystem of partners also help us address the opposition because the opposition is strong. And so we need to make sure that we are able to address that opposition. And, and one final thing that um, probably sometimes uh, is not so much in the spotlight, but also, if we really want to empower women and girls, we need to think about women and girls in the workplace as well. I'm thinking about 190 million women in global supply chains who risk not to have recognized their uh, sexual reproductive rights, plus a sort of, um, I call it a, a dark forest of informal sector. Hmm? So we don't want to leave 
any woman and girl behind. And we need to take into account a woman also as a worker and making sure that the private sector takes steps to recognize sexual reproductive rights in the workplace in all the sphere of influence um, of, of the private sector. So that I think is also a very important point. So partnering to make impact in communities and partnering also to make an impact and recognize sexual reproductive rights also in the workplace. And, and uh, as you know, UNFPA has launched a, a global coalition on reproductive justice in business that aims at influencing uh, the ESGs, the environmental, social and governance indicators with specific indicators on sexual reproductive rights in the workplace. So I think that's really a milestone we don't want to miss. Thank you. Thank you. Well, staying in line with the topic of partnerships and moving now towards the digital realm and the, the opportunities there. Um, Evelyn, Life Yangu, this is a uh, an example of a digital partnership that is having a real impact for young people in Kenya. Tell you, Can you tell us a little bit more about why this is so successful there? Sure, yeah. Yes, yeah, so last year we, we had a very uh, exciting time uh, through the partnership that we had with Bayer in which we developed this uh, digital platform through which young people are accessing information and services for SRH. And it has been very successful indeed because within one the first year we were able to reach at least 14 million young people with information and services and majority of them were able to be linked to health uh, services directly through the public sector. Now, the reason, one of the reasons, there are many, but one of the reasons that I think the, the platform has been so successful is because in the initial step, we designed this platform very closely collaborating with the young people. So their thoughts I need, the ideas I need, and therefore it resonates very well with what they would like to see in a product like that. It meets them at their point of need, for example. One of the key needs that we were trying to address with the Life Yangu was, was to respond to the challenge that young people are always saying that they have a challenge accessing correct information, that they have a challenge accessing information in a private space in a youth-friendly manner. So the fact that the platform was designed with them in mind and together with them, it responds to those problems. It resolves, it responds to that in the sense that young people at the touch of a button on an item that is on their hands, a gadget that is in their hands, they're able then to access information that is credible, information that is approved and adapted from the Ministry of Health documents and also from WHO. So in our view, the fact that the platform has a very positive perception by young people contributes to its success. But also, to mention that it guarantees them confidentiality. When a young person is online in the privacy of their space, be it in their house or in their office or in school or in colleges, using their digital uh, uh, assets, they're able then to access correct information very confidentially, therefore dealing away with the fear of uh, provider bias or being judged as has been in many instances, but that the information then is also very easy to understand because it has been simplified and it appeals to them. Um, I also want to mention uh, something around internet penetration in Kenya, which also has supported us greatly. The fact that a great number of uh, people in Kenya, right now we're talking about 22.7%, close to 30% of that population are able to access internet. Um, and majority of these would be young people. That has also helped us because then the power of reach was the power of reach was able to give us the results that we are seeing now. Um, there's also an, an important aspect to the platform, which is a locator map on that platform. When a young person logs in, after reading the information they want to read, seeing the various options, seeing the various um, tools that they can apply, and the methods, including when the myths are demystified then there is the provision of a map in which they can then use that map to identify the facility that is nearest to them. So we find that in, in a subtle way that provides that nudge for a young person to say, all right, now I've understood my options. I've had all the information that I need. I am now able to make that choice on accessing services. So that one step usually 
sometimes it's very difficult because they don't know where to go. Now it's made a lot easier because there's a map complete with directions that takes them to the various public facilities that offer youth friendly services. Uh, and at the click of a button, then they can see which facility is nearest to them. And on the map currently, we have at least 1,700 facilities listed. And from our experience so far, we see that at least 76% of the young people who have visited lifeyango.com have actually proceeded to a facility to seek services. So these are the kind of things that we're talking about as great successes that we can talk about with lifeyango.com. I stop Wonderful. There. No, thank you, Evelyn. And you made very clear what some of the aspects are, what make this platform um, so, um, you know, successful ultimately in Kenya. Um, by the way, to the audience, um, we will have a, a short Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions for our wonderful experts, feel free to write in the chat and I will ask those questions on your behalf a little bit later on. Um, I want to move now to our two new, brand new uh, partnerships. I'll start with you, Jay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more um, how the UNFPA India partnership was established and the outreach that it intends to have. Sure, it's a very exciting partnership. It has taken some time, but it's been a fantastic set of teamwork from Bear and UNFPA both. So I really, uh, on behalf of the entire UNFPA team, I want to extend my appreciation for the hard work, the collaboration and the dedication that's gone into. I think it's, it's a very innovative partnership that we are getting into and especially uh, building on the Kenya experience this is going to be an AI driven chatbot that we are collaborating on in which young people will be able to ask questions uh, which will have accurate answers and they're in a space where there's no judgment. And we just recently launched it with the government of Madhya Pradesh, one of the states in India, and everybody is very excited on the usage. I think it's already picking up. So that's, that's something we are hugely interested about because it is also user driven and it'll constantly evolve based on how people are asking questions, what are the usage experience, and then at the end of two years, there'll be an end line evaluation. So what I want to say about this partnership is, it's, it's very different. It's going to be uh, very research-based, it's going to be insightful, uh, and that's where I think the value of the partnership with Bayer is, given your global presence and our global experience and uh, on the ground experience that UNFPA has. We really want to bring the capability that we have in terms of using tech and data, and especially what we were discussing earlier, to really test this model that how do we use technology in the hands of young people to break the barriers of service providers' bias, uh, of the conservative views people may have, or the judgments people may make, and that's where I think there are these beautiful two mascots of a young boy and a young girl that we recently launched. Hopefully, they, the, because one of the research findings was that people wanted to relate to somebody like their pair, and a pair who was credible uh, with their knowledge and information. So we are very excited about this partnership. And uh, we do hope that we will be able to collaborate in such a way that we show progress through implementation implementation research as we go along and then you know learn the lessons and scale up and scale up actually and ultimately become donor independent so yeah indeed a, a great project um tt Zuri Health uh, was not as focused on family planning until this partnership has now been established. Can you tell us a little bit about Zuri and what the goals are to support girls and women through this new partnership with you? Okay, thank you for that, Ariane. Yes, when we first started, the drive and the vision behind Zuri Health was to remove the barriers to healthcare for people in Africa, across the African continent. And we wanted, and when we started, the first thing that was key for us is we wanted anyone in Africa who could afford a bottle of water to be able to have access to quality, affordable healthcare services. And we did this by providing digital platforms like WhatsApp, chatbot, SMS services that people could use to access healthcare. But in the process of building our platforms, we realized that a large percentage of our users were women. And because we wanted to make sure that the services we're offering were relevant to them, we started to look more into reproductive health services. When we started discussions with Bayer, 
what we were trying to achieve was to give women access to services. But the more we had engagement with Bea, the more we understood how critical it was for our overall vision of people having happier, healthier, and longer lives. It was so important that the women who are the primary givers at home also were able to have better well-being, gender equality, and economic empowerment as well. Now, what is so exciting about this project with Bea is not just the fact that we have been able to move from saying people with, with people who can afford a bottle of water can afford our service. Now we're saying any woman can access this digital health platform for absolutely free, regardless of if they have smartphones or feature phones, regardless of if they have access to the internet or not, any woman who requires information about her sexual and reproductive health can plug into our platform and get the information they need any hour of the day on demand. We believe that this will remove the barriers to getting the right information, having the privacy and removing stigmatization and giving women the space, a safe space to be able to access the information that they need so that they can make informed decisions about their reproductive health care. I think there's an urgency in getting this across Africa. We're starting in Kenya and we're going to be launching and moving to other African countries. And this is a win for every woman of reproductive health in Africa with unmet modern contraceptive needs. Wonderful. Yes, we're very excited about it as well. And I can see in all of your answers a little bit of overlap here. So, you know, internet penetration being key, involving young people, adjusting to the user needs, um, accuracy and in the information that's provided, a no judgment space also for young people where they can relate to their peers, um, relevant to the users, uh, remove the barriers that have existed before. And this, these are some of the, the key uh, uh, strengths of, of digital. Um, is there anything I've missed. Um, you know, we're trying to find new ways to reach girls and women and hopefully reduce the unwanted pregnancies. Um, are there any other strengths and digital approaches that you see here to any of you? If, if I may come back for just one line, actually, please, that the, the uh, you know, the overall digital ecosystem of the country is very crucial. So in India, for example, we have uh, mobile data rates, which have fallen so ridiculously low, I mean, $3 uh, per month or uh, 10 pence every day, that's really something we are relying on and reasonably accurate and reliable data systems we have. But we've got to take advantage of the government's own scale up plans to be able to meet and uh, bridge the digital divide, which I was talking about earlier. So, and you know, the objective is to reach 1 million users of our chatbot. That's something we really want to reach to. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else we've missed? TT. So one of the things that digital does is also it gives you the ability to reach a very large pool of women with our partnerships across Africa. We have currently have access to 21 African countries and over 2 million uh, subscribers in those countries. So when you look at how much access it gives you to be able to get the right information to women, you can scale very quickly and reach more people with the information, which is a very powerful thing to be able to do. Absolutely. Um, we're going to start the official Q&A now from the audience. So if any of you across the globe have any questions for our experts, please put them in the chat. Um, we have a question already that says, is it true we are living in an age where there's too much information and trying to filter through the mis the misinformation is just too much work? What do you think? Pizzi, you're nodding. Yes, uh, especially for young people. Young people are flooded with all manner of information, all sorts of disinformation, and it's very hard for them to be able to sift through what is true. Now, one of the things that we have seen with digital platforms and one of the things we're implementing in uh, the approach that we're using for our partnership with Bayer is that we are also selecting people who have a very large digital presence, who are credible health influencers, who are able to also inform properly and give the required information that can direct women to the right channels to get the information that they need. So across Kenya, we have digital influencers who are very good and very uh, medical 
doctors qualified who can provide information and girls are already listening to them and they're able to direct to the right information. So when you're thinking about digital, you also need to be looking at how are you able to change behavior? How are you able to provide the right information and how are you able to get the respect of your audience and all these things are things that you have to put into any program that's going to be reaching people in the digital age. Mm, makes sense. Maria Rosa. Um, I, I just wanted to add another angle to, to Titi's angles. Um, it's quantity, uh, it's also quality, it's also safety of information. Um, we, we launched a campaign uh, which is called the Body Right Campaign, which is against digital gender-based violence hmm? and, the, and the impact of using artificial intelligence, of using information, of using what are called innovative solutions against the integrity of, of, of a woman's and a girl's body. So I think that's also another very important aspect to take into consideration besides the quantity and the quality of information, but also the safety and the ethical aspect. And, and last week, uh, the Security Council, the UN Security Council had a set, held a session on artificial intelligence and also its impact and its and its practical implications on 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 human let's say life so i think that aspect needs to be absolutely taken into consideration whenever we start a partnership uh, around innovation but innovation connected to digital and artificial intelligence so i think that's that's something that we really want to keep high in the attention, in the global attention, the safety of information. Mm -hmm. Another question here, where do you see next steps in the realm of digital and family planning? What would be your hope for the future? Maybe Evelyn, I'll turn to you. No, you're still uh, muted. How's that? There, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think that um, it is prudent that we see scale up of successful practices. So for instance, what we have done with Life Yangu, within one year, the numbers we've talked about and still counting, it is important that such um, innovations uh, are scaled up to cover more geographies. But also, I think there's no harm in having more uh, platforms uh, so that we protect our young people from hovering all over the internet, trying to access information and in the process landing in wrong sites. I think that um, the other thing that I would hope for is um, increased support and investment uh, by uh, potential partners uh, and other development actors so that then we have, again, more robust uh, platforms or digital solutions that are changing with the times. I think one of the greatest challenges that we must deal with when you're talking about digital solutions is the, the fluidity around it, the, the fast moving, the fast evolving uh, nature of, of technology. So to be able to keep up with that, I think there is need, there's need to see greater investments, greater innovation, so that we keep up, in fact, stay a step ahead uh, of, the, the, of the technology developments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question's come in for Jay. The interaction with governments is of course very important to make progress in the realm of digital. How has this supported your project? Where do you see the greatest value? Yes, both, both the state governments, Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan have been very supportive and they see the great value of public-private partnership. So the governments uh, very quickly have recognized that these are some of the strengths of innovation and credibility and new technology that people not, do not always trust the government with alone. Young people tend to rely on various sources, but this kind of a partnership uh, makes it more credible. So I think this multi-sectoral uh, partnership between the United Nations, the private sector, the government, brings a new strength. Uh, and also, the, going with the private sector alone won't have the advantage. So they, I think the government is very keen to understand how their scale and their reach can be used to improve the quality and greater innovation which can come from the private sector. So I think we are in this unique intersection 
of new experimentation of a partnership which is truly equal because each partner is keen to learn from the other and understands that one can't run this alone and therefore both the governments interestingly have talked about research feeding into policy and that's something we were very keen to do uh, which i was emphasizing earlier that really insights need to be brought out on how people are using what they are finding out and to feed back into the government into policy even regulation and safety like maria rosa was mentioning i think that is so important when a girl has a phone in her hand uh, she could equally become vulnerable unless empowered and you know advised and counseled and skilled on how to safely use it so i think there's a great part have a new partnership with amazon web service and who are truly digital and they were at pains to explain from their side that how crucial the safety angles are as more and more phones go into the hands of young people so i think that crucial role of government and private sector comes in very well again the importance of the partnerships as you said uh, maria rosa mentioned earlier um one final question here i don't want to miss um coming in um we hear a lot about smartphones coverage and internet penetration over when looking at research we see that especially young people often report lack of money to buy mobile data and poor quality of internet in many areas as main barriers to access digital solutions how could we contribute to closing the access gap for vulnerable populations like young people or refugees rather than only benefiting people who already come from higher socioeconomic levels a very very good question the vulnerable uh, topic is something we discuss very often in this field um titi go for it okay so we are answering this and we're addressing this already in our partnership with bea for the tech hub that we provide to women we also provide the services via sms now 65 percent of people in africa do not have access to smartphones but they do have phones and they're able to test text send text messages and sms messages which is one of the key components of the service that we're currently providing and what's even more beautiful and important is that we are also doing this for free so anyone who has a phone and can send a text message can access the services of getting the education and information they need as well as direction to get fitted if they want to get fitted after the consultation and this will be done absolutely free Thank you. Just in 30 seconds, each of you, as we end, what would be your key takeaway for the audience uh, to take with them as they leave this event? I'll start with you, Maria Rosa. Thank you. Well, um, key takeaway, uh, we need partnerships like this. We need an Im immediate action. There's no, no time to lose, time to waste. Um, but we, we need to put forces, we need to put our forces and, and added value together. So I'm, I'm, I'm a true believer in these ecosystems of partners that really have a very strong impact in communities. Mm -hmm. So multi-layered but complementary. Thank you. Evelyn, how about you? Thank you. I think um, the future is in the digital space. And therefore, it is important and urgent that uh, family planning is integrated into all other applications that are out there, all other digital solutions for, M, you know, the M Health and what have you. It is critical because they are working, and therefore, the missing link would be how we can then reach women with information on family planning using whatever is already out there. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, how about you? I think digital is the engine, there's no doubt about it. But I think we should not forget the non-digital aspects of the ecosystem, which, which, are, which are like the tracks on which the digital engine is running, and the data and the evidence and the insights. I think that's very crucial, what's coming up and what's being used and where are we learning lessons and being agile and implementing those lessons. Thank you. And Titi? I would say collaboration is key uh, for someone like me who's walked across Africa for 17 years in the mobile space. I did not know that at some point in time I am able to partner with Bayer to reach women with services that they need. But because we're looking for innovative ways to reach women and we're looking putting the women at the heart of the solutions that we're putting together, we are seeing the need for more collaboration across the ecosystem as well. Thank you.
Well, with that, we end our LinkedIn event, Digital Innovation and its Impact on Family Planning. But it's only the beginning of the movement and helping more girls and women and, of course, families. And we will continue to look for new partnership and new ways to use innovation to make progress in the realm of family planning, also specifically when it comes to digital options. So let's work together to continue to have a real impact more to come, I'm sure. Uh, thank you so much to all the panelists for your excellent insights and for educating us further. And also a big thank you to our audience from around the world for taking the time to join us today. We'll see you all soon.